let's start getting into a couple of things that I, I want to share with you. Um, this first piece that I'm going to share with you is a piece that we did with the FAA. And as much as I counseled the FAA about equipment, and they did go get the equipment I suggested they use, they just didn't read the manual. They didn't learn how to use the equipment. So let's have a look at this piece I'm doing with a, a gentleman from the FAA here. Now this is a guy using a DSLR. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Dave Kraus. I am an industry member and an of Audio the Technica M10 series wireless. We are here today to discuss risk management and have it's the abysmal of teaming alongside of owning the gear Sunday doesn't mean much. So this we'll skip presentation forward. is going to be recorded. We will uh, be asking. This is called a risk assessment made is to expose you to some of the thought processes same camera that may help you same as wireless you get involved mic. in risk management. The only difference is so I'm in front of the So let's just dive right in. The so point risk is management knowing how to use the equipment is pretty uh, darn truly important. Truly is, is really what I'm getting a part to. of that decision. Let's look at another example here. This is this setup that you're about to see and hear is just this kit. Now it's nothing fantastic. It's not anything that's going to make you right home and say, I'm "Oh, video it's, specialist here it's the next robotics. big feature film." It's Today, not. I'm here to teach you how to All shoot that you're HDR seeing right here is an audio, te aircraft. audio Technica System 10. In case you haven't figured out, I really like AT products. I'd I'll like get into why a little bit a little later. Bit about uh, we're HDR. seeing a System 10, and, and we're seeing it lit with HDR stands for high dynamic range. One of these little aperture lights. If you've ever seen these, they're dialable. You can do a lot with them. I just keep clamp mounts mounted on them because all of a sudden I now have a light stand in a table. I have a light stand in a chair. I have a light stand in my case. The process of actually creating an HDR image is taking photos at multiple exposures and then stitching them together into one. If I need it diffused, it can be diffused. If I don't need it diffused, we can pull it off and we have a non-diffused light. We can do some pretty interesting things with Let's take a look uh, at the effects. process of actually taking So the blue you're the seeing, the, the blue and the green that you see shifting back there are literally these lights. Once you're we in need the to create a, a cop light effect, the camera you know, somewhere view, in the background, or have something that's an interesting accent. Screen. We have it. Our first option so is So there's a lot size. of things that we can do was, with hi, these various pieces, of, various pieces of equipment. And so we don't need big anymore. The days of carrying you know, a, a, a generator, Generac system and a series of lunch boxes and having to have C stands and having to have, uh, you know, redheads and, and so forth, those days are over as far as I'm concerned. Now, if you're dealing with big production stuff, sure, we, we need a different setup. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about one man, two men, or one person, two person, uh, run and gun, or uh, interview scenarios, or training video scenarios, etc. Now, for those of you who know a little bit about my background, you may be familiar with, or you can run down to the NAB bookstore down there. Uh, I have produced just a little over 300 training DVDs for a number of different clients, whether it's Adobe or Blackmagic Design or uh, back in the days of Serious Magic. So we've done a lot of that, and, and we began paring our equipment down because the greatest amount of time, the greatest amount of non-billable time is set up. Now, sometimes you can bill for that, but for the most part, you're billing for the time that you're behind the camera and you're billing for the time that you're behind the editing system. And, you know, of course, you're fine or deliverable. So we began, you know, shortening things down. So we're going to talk about a few different things, some of the equipment that we can use, some of the different types of equipment we can use. Uh, just before I get too far into it, if any of you see the film on Amazon over the pandemic, it was the number one horror genre film called Abigail. Any of you see that by chance? Number one horror genre film on Amazon Prime uh, through three months of the pandemic. That film was produced almost entirely on a cell phone, and I would challenge you to tell me that you knew it was produced on a cell phone. It is remarkably well produced by a man named Kelly Schwartz. I tried to get Kelly to come speak at the conference today, but he's uh, a little bit involved with another larger project. But the point is, is we're doing some really amazing things with, again, small equipment. So we're talking about cameras and our lighting, and we've got a variety of different tools. We've got uh, our microphones, which are hypercritical, and that's why you see more mics here than you see almost anything else. Uh, talk a little bit about some of our software and some of our switching systems that we, we have available to us. You're going to need to have a tripod. Uh, I do carry typically a really lightweight uh, tripod, such as this Mi Photo. It comes in either carbon fiber or comes in aluminum. Uh, I recommend that you carry the carbon fiber version, even though my picture right there is aluminum. Um, I'm a real fan of the, the Manfrotto Mi Photo uh, systems. You can buy those or you can buy from any camera store, B&H, Adorama, uh, even Amazon has them on their, their channel. Uh, big, big fan of 
carrying them. Why do I prefer carbon fiber uh, over the, alum the aluminum? For a couple of reasons. If you're in really cold, cold environments, the aluminum is a pain. It's difficult to get anything to slide. Uh, it, it also attracts, in dirty environments, it attracts the sand and holds on to sand and dirt, dust. The lubricant uh, that's on the aluminum can give you some trouble. So I prefer the carbon fiber for that particular reason. Extremely lightweight, they don't, they don't cost very much. And cost is a big factor in some of what I'm about to talk about. Uh, we'll get there in just a second. But we can put all different kinds of heads and, and so forth on them. We don't need heavy liquid uh, fluid filled heads, et cetera, because we're generally dealing with you know, A7s or other DSLR types of cameras. We're not dealing with big heavy systems. We're not putting an F300 or, or something like that on there. So we don't need a high end fluid head. We can have a fairly low end fluid head. If it'll support an eight pound camera, you're, you're in great shape, and all of these will support that. Now, there is a problem with them. Well, falling down due to what? Due to weight, and, and because they are super lightweight. Yeah, it's exactly the problem. So how do we tighten them down? How do we, how do we lock them into place? There's a few ways you can do it. You can either do it really ex expensively, and you can buy something like the Photo Pro water bags. They're bags that you fill with water, and you can hang them. And a one-gallon bag of water weighs eight pounds. So we can do that. Another thing we can do for an outdoor environment is we'll, we'll sink a stake uh, into the ground at an angle and we'll run a, a, a cable with a monkey zip on it. That'll lock that down to the ground. That's the biggest challenge with these. You don't want to carry weight. You want to carry something you can weight in the field. And water's everywhere. Pretty much anywhere you go, you're going to run into water. So you can carry these very inexpensive water bags. They're available from a variety of different manufacturers in the photo world. They're not unusual. Uh, basically, in many places, we're replacing sandbags with water. But you can also hang a sandbag. And if you, on almost all of these tripods, you're going to find a, a hook underneath. That hook is exactly for putting a weight bag on it. Lighting. Lighting systems are, are where we really run into some challenges, and lighting systems change in a variety of different ways. Now, this particular shot here, I, or the, and, and tripod, you're seeing this tripod with a, a very inexpensive ring light on it. No, it's not what I recommend you that you use for most types of things. If you're doing just talking head over a computer, they work great. For production, not so much. But what is good is you're looking at a light stand here that these types of light stands are really inexpensive. They're quite lightweight. This is, this is a $10 light stand. And some of you may look at a $10 light stand with a little bit of snobbery and say, well, I would never use something so cheap. I would, you know why? They're disposable. In fact, in a, a variety, in several different scenarios, whoops, in several different scenarios, I've been out where I've been teaching youth uh, this very program or, or some of these different programs and pieces. And when the gig is over, I just hand them the tripods and say, here you go. There's no reason to keep them. I don't need them. You know, and in some cases, depending on where I'm going, there have been times where I don't want to carry my tripod bag. This is the one thing that doesn't fit into my case. I can buy a, a stand that'll fit in that case, but they're stupid expensive. The Amazon Basics tripod stands, they're $9.99. Buy three of them, I'm 30 bucks into it. How much is it going to cost me to carry that extra piece of luggage on the plane? A lot more than 30 bucks depending on what airline I'm flying on. So what I fly with my tripods in, just so that you can kind of get a glimpse, this is a, a tripod bag, and I can, this type of tripod, I can carry 15 of these in this little bag. So they're, these, these are 10 bucks, uh, between 10 and 15 bucks on uh, some of the different sites like overstock.com, they, they don't cost much. I like them because they're set up and they're divided with, with dividers in here that hold on to things. I literally, just throw everything into them, even C47s. So always carry clothes. If you don't know this trick, always carry clothespins everywhere you go. Clothespins are the coolest thing in the, in the production world because they cost nothing. They have their own designation. In case you didn't know, we call these C47s. Um, needless to say, I carry kind of everything in here, even just silly spare lighting equipment, it all goes in. So inexpensive tripod, no, I don't use ring lights as a general position, but I wanted you to see that you can carry really inexpensive lighting stand. Then the lighting instruments, I've told you about a couple of them. I'm a uh, big, big fan of light panels, if you have seen their products. Um, I have used these in the skydiving and the ground environment for years. They weigh nothing, fully battery powered. They have a super high output. They're a little nicer output than the apertures. The thing I like most about the apertures is on the back, they have magnets. So if I need to light up under the underside of a vehicle, or if I need to light something where I've, I've got a hallway that maybe has some of the metal trim on corners, 
et cetera, these just pop right on and I don't need to use the clamp. So they're really great to use. The, uh, the batteries in these do not come out. That's a drawback. The batteries are internal. So when the battery dies, you're plugging in, your production stops. So you need to be able to build your production timeline roughly when you're working with this kind of equipment, excuse me, you have roughly four hours in production. So if you can't produce your shot, your, your scene or your segment in under four, in, in uh, less than four hours, battery powered equipment probably isn't for you. And, and remote traveling equipment probably isn't for you. But there are so many products that we can carry. I've shown you the apertures, there's the light panel pros, uh, another, uh, let's see, somewhere, I'm missing my, I carry a, the Fox Fury Rugo, and for some reason, I got here without a full Rugo kit, but this little light that you see here is made by a company called Fox Fury, they're on the floor here, it's called the Rugo. These are really great lights to use, and I'll be talking about them in a, another session later, but they have three lenses on them, you have a pin spot, a flat, a flat light, which is a diffused light, and then you have a flood. And these have four different levels of intensity, all the way up to 800 lumens. Some of you may have seen my lighting classes where I have lit you know, three, four person sets using these very small lights. They can go onto these small tripods. I just add a, a very inexpensive ball head to my tripod. That allows me to adjust all my angles. I'm a huge fan of small lighting. And if you haven't uh, seen some of the lighting systems that are out there, there's just, there are myriad instruments that we can get into. So this is a, uh, a light panel pro kit gives you three different lights. Uh, these lights can all be screwed together to make basically a one by one. They also have these small Fresnels. This is called the Calibri series. You notice they come also with the Amazon basic style. Oh, do we have a question? Yes, sir. Light panel? Oh, Fox Fury. Yes, Fox Fury, F-O-X-F-U-R-Y, Fox Fury. And uh, Fox Fury products are made here in the United States. They're made down in San Diego, California. Um, small family business mostly focused on law enforcement, military. They just got into production lighting maybe 10 years ago, and they build production lighting. If you saw uh, 13 Hours, that, that film is, is uh, all the cave scenes and so forth are lit with Fox Fury lighting. They built some really great production equipment, and those Rugos are their smallest of their production series. Yep, thank you for asking. This is the light panel system. Uh, again, they call these the Calibri. They come with this setup, they come with the, the this is the Amazon Basics uh, light stand that you see right there that comes with it. Again, really lightweight stuff. Here's this Fox Fury Rugo that I started to tell you about. I have used this light on some very large systems. They can be used as a primary light. They can be used as an accent light, hair light, fill light, uh, all kinds of different things. So this, right, this shot right here is a key lit with the Fox Fury Rugos. That's a $49 or $59 light, sir. In this scene right here, you're seeing four of them. There's two on the key and two on me. Yeah. Um, and there is, and I should also mention, there is just an ambient room light that the only place you can see it is at the very top of my hairline. And that's just because it was there and present and that's why I left it in place. But so there's four Fox, so what you're looking at in this particular scenario is a $189 lighting setup, all in. Stands, lights for 189 bucks. Works pretty good. Right? So this is where the fun kind of starts to come in as you start working with these smaller products and challenging yourself to get creative again. So here's my editorial comment. I've been in this industry for a long time. Let's face it, it gets boring after a while, unless you're doing something new. And it's really fun to take on a challenge of working with something that is, is new and figuring out how you work it. Now, some of you just sat in here in Jeff Greenberg's uh, a class a few moments ago. Jeff and I have been teaching alongside each other for 30 years. One of the things that is really fun with Jeff, we were in, over, in fact, we were over in Israel. And you remember when in Is we had the Occupy Wall Street that was going on here, they had something very similar in Tel Aviv. We're over in Tel Aviv and we're seeing these, these very young kids, this has probably been, what, 18, 19 years ago. Jeff and I are speaking in Tel Aviv, we're walking past the Occupy Wall Street protests that are going on, and there's these college kids that are doing interviews with kind of a tiny kit like this. And Jeff stopped talking to Billy Goldenberg, you guys know who Billy is? He's, he's nobody, you know, well known other than his Oscars for Ali, Seabiscuit, I mean, he's just, Jeff, or uh, Billy's got this long line of credits. Jeff just kind of looked at Billy and said, excuse me for a second. And he ran down the street, chased down these kids with his production stuff. And he spent the next hour 
you know, going over all this new equipment, some of which we'd never seen before because the equipment was coming out of strange places like Russia and Turkey and Hungary, products we've never seen here in the United States. And this is what kind of keeps some of us, I, I think it's what keeps some of us really enthusiastic about the industry. As we find this new stuff, we get to play with it. So play with something new. Enough editorializing, let's just kind of keep going through here. This is an aperture kit. They build a kit that's got uh, chargers, uh, everything all built in for the lighting system right there. That, that kit that you're looking at sells for $800, so it's a little bit on the steeper side. But look at what you're getting into it. You know, you've, you've uh, all of a sudden got a, a huge array of lights that you can work with, a dozen lights that you can light with. And if you can't light with that, you're not going to be able to light anything because it's a super powerful kit. Whoops. The audio side. This is where my passion lies. Um, audio is, is my thing. My first Grammy Award was, was as a producer for a recording that I created using, again, a small pocket remote production system. But audio, with, without audio, we have nothing. Audio is 70% of what we see. I said that right. Audio is 70% of what we see. We can take bad audio, put it to an amazing film, and the amazing film is a terrible film. We can take great audio, put it into a mediocre film, and all of a sudden, it's a great film. And this has been proven time and time and time again. There are many different studies and examples of, of how audio impacts what we think we are seeing. So audio, without great audio, we're going to get nowhere. So this is where I'm going to spend a little bit more time than maybe I should. So we have the hardware side, we have the uh, software side, and we have the actual equipment side. So a couple of different things that we want to be looking at is you want to have good audio recording equipment. Now you can record great into most of the cameras that are out there unless you're using a DSLR. None of the DSLRs have what I call a high quality DAC or digital audio converter built into them, not even the Sonys that we all love and adore so much. So secondary audio, backup audio records to an external device of some kind in my world. But again, this is pretty important to me. This gives me four XLR and high z inputs, so I can put in high impedance microphones, low impedance microphones. Uh, it is a battery operated system, and on four batteries I can get about 16 hours of life out of this little recorder. It has some p tools built into it that I personally don't use, but you might like. It has e equalizers built into them, it has got compressors built into it, so we can really tweak our audio in the field. I'm not a fan of that. It's kind of like baking cookies. Once you've committed chocolate chips to the batter, it's really hard to pull it back out. So I tend to record my chocolate chips all by themselves and mix it later on in, in post and get the sound that I want. When I'm in an environment that isn't my, my headphones, that I can listen on a good set of monitors and see what's going on. So this is pretty important to me. The other reason that this is type of a system is great is if you're on a two or three camera shoot, now all of a sudden we have a splitter mixer. So I can bring all the audio into this one box and then on the output sides of it, we can split this out to all of our cameras so we have a reference track on every single camera. It makes it a lot easier to sync. In fact, if you're using in, in Premiere or in Final Cut, if you're using a tool like Pluralize, Pluralize can take all of your dif disparate cameras and immediately sync them up as though they were time, time code locked or they were a gen lock system based on the audio. So Pluralize is going to look for similarities in the audio wave file. Well, if everything's recorded here and then split out, now we have identical audio on all of our cameras. This is a very fast way to create a GenLock-like experience. And today, most, most of us probably aren't using GenLock anymore. I'm sure there's a few, but it's something that is, is uh, trending away from what we're doing. Microphones. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the microphone side of things. Wow. Microphones are people. Every microphone has a personality. And there are some personalities we like and some personalities that we don't like. And we identify you know, the ones we like based on, on what we hear, how we feel about that sound. Is that sound granular? Does it have texture? Is it flighty and airy where we have lots of loft in it? Is it uh, really resonant in the bottom end? We're going to find what system, what microphone type works best for us. And we all have our, our own needs and our own wants. We're going to need to have something to, I'll talk more about the mics in just a minute. We need to be able to get the audio into something some way. And there's lots and lots of adapters that we can use. Um, I'm a big fan of either one of these two systems right here. One thing that's nice about the Sabrent system that you're seeing here um, is that with the Sabrent system, this becomes this. Your cell phone, has, most cell phones have actually got very, very good DACs, digital audio converters built into them. Uh, much better than you might expect. Why? Because a good DAC, good audio that is properly compressed, encodes better into a digital stream than 
non-well compressed, non-well EQ'd, non-robust audio. So these phones have got pretty good DACs built into them, and this can become a great secondary recording system. And in fact, if you're, if you're a, a run and gun or you're a road warrior with these kinds of things, this also becomes a really nice secondary microphone system. We can put this into the jacket pocket or uh, into a, a lapel breast pocket or something like that, and this becomes a great recording tool. It's also great for recording gnats. So if you need natural sounds from the environment, this is a great tool to, to use. So never put aside the idea that we can't use a cell phone for some of the work that we do. There's also things like the Ceremonic systems. Um, these are, these are uh, an active rig system. So they have built-in uh, phantom power. You can see here it's got a, a 48 volt switch. That's important if you're using phantom power microphones. Most of my microphones are phantom powered. In other words, they're electric condenser. That means they need to have power delivered to the microphone somehow. Some of them, we have uh, batteries that are built into the microphones. And so let's see, yeah. So some of them, the battery is, is built right into the mic. If I can get that guy open. There we go. So we've got a battery uh, system inside of here. I don't ever use it. Uh, why? Because as the bat if you use the battery only and you're not using phantom power, as that battery starts to fade, so does the quality of your audio change. Where if we use 48 volt, then it stays stable. Here's what's interesting. If you use the battery that's in here and the battery begins to fade, your audio changes. This is a battery powered device. However, when the battery begins to fade in this device, it's still delivering a pure 48 volts. So the microphone continues to sound the same no matter what until that battery dies. So it's a way of making sure that your microphones stay in uh, high quality shape. Uh, if I'm using a, a wireless system, same, same story, I'm gonna input any one of these different systems here. Sometimes you might wanna have a preamp. So there's lots and lots of different kinds of preamps, especially if you're gonna record directly into a laptop. This is a, a USB made by Mark of the Unicorn, Mo2, Mark of the Unicorn. That's a really great preamp and converter. It happens to use the same DAC chip as this has. So again, this small little $399 box has a great DAC built into it. It's ADC or it's audio digital or analog digital converters that are built into this, both on the input and output side. Very, very well made. So I don't need that particular device. This also has a digital uh, output on it, so I can output digitally over optical, over speed if, either one, into the system. So again, you know, I'm, I'm killing a lot of birds with that one stone there. Here's another one, this is the PreSona, sells for 99 bucks. This is really designed initially for musicians. It's designed for a musician that maybe they've got a guitar, they've got a microphone, they wanna record stuff into their, their laptop or their home computer system. This was built for that person, but it is a good single channel system coming in at $99. The one that we just looked at a moment ago, that's a dual channel system. So we're paying a little bit less for two channels. Microphones. Lots of different kinds of microphones that are out there. These are three USB mics. These are not good for remote production. They're really great when you're working with something locally. The Audio-Technica that you see right here can be built, can be purchased as a remote mic, uh, or it can be purchased as a, a USB mic, either one. For those of you who've seen any of my podcasts that I am doing, I'm using, this is the, this is the Audio-Technica USB 2020. Again, can be a USB mic or can be a standard XLR mic. It has a built-in 2090 tube. For those of you that are you know, Fender Twin Reverb fans, or you like tubular, the, the sound of tube, which is warm and rich, you know, Eddie Van Halen called it the, the brown sound, um, that microphone gives it to you. That will take any person in this room and turn your voice into Howard Stern really nicely. It's a great tube mic, and they're cheap. They're only 129 bucks for the USB model and $199 for the, the regular XLR model. Uh, I, one of the things that we have here is what is called a directed session. Now, during the pandemic, we saw lots and lots of remote production. I was really glad at that point for my background in remote production because part of what I do is consult or help people figure things out. And the best tool for remote production is right here. One of the things that we can do is download a software product called Unity. Some, some of you may or may not have seen it. Unity is a really great tool. If you're on a small production where you've only got three or four people you're working with, Unity doesn't cost you anything. So what this is, is this becomes a two-way radio 
that we can send data down line with multiple channels if we're on a larger production. So the lighting crew could have a channel, the audio crew could have a channel, the camera crew has a channel, et cetera. And the director can monitor all of the channels or speak on any of the channels through Unity. So this is a really handy tool for us to be able to use. And then we have uh, non-directed sessions where there's nothing that's happening in real time. I want to show you an example of a directed session. Some of you might be familiar with the 90 Day Fiance, Fiance franchise. Uh, if you're not, don't feel bad. It really is trash TV, but boy, a lot of people watch it. Um, I think 90 Days has now turned into something like 80 spinoffs. It's just insane what, what they're doing with it. But this is a, an example of a directed session. Today was supposed to be my wedding day, but... So there's a producer that is watching it's this as it's being recorded remotely. After I realized that we're not getting married, I couldn't stay in the house, I couldn't even look so at So the producer uh, is, so, so these are, you'll notice these are all, almost all fixed camera positions. The talent so in these scenes is tomorrow. shooting with cell phones during the pandemic, they don't normally work this way, <laughs> but shooting uh, with a, 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 a cell phone and there's a director that's on a phone that's giving them information about what they need yes, to ask, what they need to say, what they want to see in the scene. Pretty, pretty simple um, stuff. You know, nobody cares about the quality of the video because it's, it's trash TV. Michael bought me tickets But at least to France, you get the, the idea of how uh, this can be directed there, and, and what kinds of things can be there. Here and there, you will actually hear train. the producer's voice sure over Unity um, in, in some of the scenes where the producer's asking questions, she's responding to the questions. And yeah, it's, it's a terrible video, but it sure as heck sells. Remember, content and is I king. Tell my mom. So, Today was supposed to be so one of the things that you really need to have is a second monitor with your computer system or anything that you might be working with in a remote. And I'm not going to show all of that here. Um, I use, not only do I use a computer monitor, but everywhere I go, I'm carrying one of the, the uh, Blackmagic Design systems. Uh, the nice thing about Blackmagic Design is I've got two SDI inputs. So if I'm working with higher end cameras, I can go straight in. Or if I'm working with my older uh, AJA system, I can plug straight into, or we can plug straight into this and monitor directly off of this. This also allows me the benefit of taking a LUT if you're using lookup tables. Anybody in here using LUTs? If you're not, I hope you learn about them, something you should be involved in. It makes, uh, it'll take a, a low-grade camera and turn it into a pro-grade camera really quickly. Needless to say, we can import a LUT directly into here and see our video the way it's going to look when we put a LUT into it in the editing suite. So there's a lot of things you can do with these really inexpensive monitors. These are about 500 bucks. They're uh, battery, battery powered. Black Magic Design has them in 5 inch, 7 inch, and 12 inch uh, sizes. I use the 5s and the 7s. I find these indispensable. They've got quarter 20s all around the top and the bottom, so they're very easy to put on a camera cage. So if you're working with something um, like the Wooden series, or maybe you've got a Zacuto cage, or some of these different types of systems for your DSLR, these can very, be, very easily be mounted. Throw them onto an Israeli arm coming off of a light stand. You've got a really great monitor excuse me, to work with on field. So this is an example of a, a really quick remote setup. Um, in this particular case, I'm using the video assist and then I've got a couple of other just regular generic computer monitors. Uh, some of the computer monitors, this one that you can see down here on the lower left-hand panel, that is powered by a couple of internal batteries. It's got a five-hour battery life. You can pick these up at, at B&H or Autorama or just about any store out there for around $125 to $149. They're very inexpensive and again, they're rechargeable, they give you anywhere, some of the bigger systems will give you up to 10 hours of battery life. Some of them even allow you to put a LUT file into it. So again, you can see exactly what it's gonna look like in the field. They're cheap, in case something goes south in your travels with it all, you can replace it fairly inexpensive and it's a, a beneficial tool to have. A couple of other things that I carry uh, for a lot of the work that I do or a fair amount of the work that I do, you can see the same inexpensive tripod in the background. That's a, a tablet holder. You can use an Android tablet as a secondary monitor. It can become part of your video village. Did you have a question, sir? Oh, oh you just had, you just relaxed, cool. So we can use a monitor, or a, a tablet rather, uh, an Android tablet or an, an iPad as a video village monitor, as a village monitor, if that's what we need. Those little stands are quite inexpensive, about 99 bucks. You'll notice uh, one of the Blackmagic design switchers that are down there, I use those pretty frequently these days. There's the Manfrotto tripod that I spoke of earlier with the Blackmagic Design Pocket Cinema. I often switch back and forth between my A7 and the, the Pocket Cinema. Um, I really like the Pocket Cinema because of the micro four-thirds sensor that's on it and I've got a bunch of MF, MFT lenses that I'm not ready to part ways with just yet. But that's a pretty typical quick setup. 
There's nothing expensive, and everything you see there could be carried easily. This is the Audio-Technica uh, M10 wireless mic series. Again, I like those. I've got 16 channels of, of uh, mic channels of capability with it. Very similar setup. Uh, again, the, the micro cinema uh, camera monitor mounted on the tripod. So one of the things I've got is a, a, an L bracket that allows me to put a monitor onto any type of a tripod. Now, why would I want that? Every now and again, I need to, I need to use a Chiron. But instead of using a front of camera system, we'll just throw a monitor on there. And if the monitor is right in front of the camera, such as you see right here, it works out as a really great way for us to, to be able to get that information across. So I've already mentioned the, the Blackmagic Design Switcher system. One of the things I really like about the various BMD systems is we can, we can preview uh, any of our four camera setups. So if we've got a, a typical switcher like this one, I can monitor or you can monitor all four cameras simultaneously. We can monitor our keys. We understand what our inserts are going to look like. We can even control outside remote decks. Very small, inexpensive, and although they're not battery powered, they will run off of a battery bank. I'll talk about other power here in just a, a second. But these will also allow us, you'll notice you've got an ATEM control. These can be remotely controlled, so if you've got an editor or if you've got a producer that's in a remote location, you need to be able to control from that remote location. We can also bring them in over the network to control all of our camera switching via software. So this is truly a, a, an amazing piece of kit right there. Um, you just need to be sure that you've got clean power. And again, you can get power into these things a variety of different ways without having to worry about batteries. I've kind of mentioned the external uh, monitoring. The one thing that I didn't mention is these also can be used as a recorder. So you can record 422 ProRes directly into these systems. Uh, there's a variety of other codecs as well. If you need DNX, you can use the Avid codex, all of them directly into the little Blackmagic design device. So if you just simply want to use a, a camera, for example, the, um, the micro cinema that you saw, the pocket cinema that you saw there, we don't record in the pocket cinema. We just record directly into this system here. Why? Well, there's two reasons for it. One of the reasons is because as we're inputting into this system, it's capturing it uh, from the feed of the uh, ATEM switcher. So we're getting a, a, um, a produced piece at the very end of the day. Or we can split it out and just record individually into individual channels. So there's a lot of things that we can do with these little video assist systems that you might not necessarily uh, concern or get concerned with. All right, now I want to just talk about the microphones and talk a little bit about some of the other lighting pieces that I, I've got here so that you've got an, a little bit of an idea of what we're looking at. First off, who has one of these or something similar? Okay, is this your primary mic? A couple of you, yeah, most of you know. Throw them away. These are really cute. How many of you using something like this, maybe build onto your camera or put on your camera and you're shooting indoors? Bad stuff. Why don't we want to do this? Why is this a bad idea? So if you listen to the room for just a second, is this a live room or a dead room? It's a live room, right? It's got quite a bit of echo. The way that a shotgun microphone works, it is designed to have the, the uh, primary amount of SPL, sound pressure level, going into the end of the microphone. And many folks mistakenly believe that it rejects everything off to the side. Well, no, it doesn't. It hears everything up and down the shaft, up and down the tube. What ends up happening is as you start having audio hit various portions of the tube, if we're in a live echoey room and we have any distance from the head of the microphone to our subject, the SPL, the sound pressure level that hits the sides, is equal to the SPL that hits the front. So, so some of you said you've used these on your cameras. How many times has it sounded great in the room? You get back to the studio and you have something that sounds like this. That's because you're using a shotgun microphone indoors. Shotguns are not designed for indoor use. There are some rare situations where we use them. If, for example, you are a voiceover artist or you're doing ADR work, a shotgun microphone aimed right here at the side of the mouth will give you that Howard Stern sound because, again, the SPL is very tight, the pressure level is very, very tight, and it's not hitting the tube at equal pressures. But that's one of the primary reasons why we never use these. So what do we use? There's a lot of different things that we can use. One of the, and by the way, if you come to my choosing a microphone class, I will be plugging all of these into the mixing system and you'll be able to hear them all live and we'll work with them in that, that regard. We just don't have time to do that in this session. So what do we do? Well, there's a few things. One is we can put a lav on. Labs are really great ways to work. If you want to have a truly robust sound, put a lav and run your shotgun. But 
don't rely I recommend you not rely just on this shotgun. You'll never win great audio. And worse than that, you probably all have great video chops. You're really great at lighting, everything else, but your sound comes out like this. And how much time are you spending correcting your audio? Worse, how much time are you spending removing reverb from a room? It's a nightmare. And God forbid you're in an environment that's got running water, traffic, or on-off AC, because it's virtually impossible to run a noise reduction algorithm on any of those kinds of sounds, particularly what's being captured with a shotgun mic because of the variable frequency and the amplitude of those frequencies. So we're gonna run a, a lav along with a shotgun. That's one way, one way that we can work. Another way we can work is, if you don't mind your, your mic being on camera, use a handheld, get it in to, to the subject where you can. That's another methodology. Then I have a sort of a, a secret weapon. Some of you may have seen this before. This is called the Audio-Technica 4053. The AT4053 is the first microphone to ever win an Emmy Award. This was designed specifically for the television series St. Elsewhere. You remember that? One of the problems they had in St. Elsewhere was they shot a lot of those scenes in a real hospital. So you've got linoleum floors, you have concrete or drywall painted glossy walls or, God forbid, tile walls. And you've got uh, hard ceilings above, sometimes drop ceilings, but more often hard ceilings. Lots and lots of reflectivity in the rooms. And so they built this microphone with a couple things in mind. They build it with a standard head for typical boom use. So this, is, this can go on a boom. You, uh, by the way, if you guys haven't seen the new Zacuto uh, solo boom, it's a really cool tool because it puts a boom on your camera instead of putting a boom on a, a stand. Um, but this will go on a Zacuto or any other, any other type of a fixed boom. But if we've got problems with our audio, we can remove the head, and we can throw on a super cardioid head instead. And this is my secret weapon. With, with this system, I've, I don't mean to keep talking about Grammy Awards, but I have two Grammy Awards thanks to this little, this little tool. So I'm a big fan of what these do. And you will never find yourself in an environment where you can't get great audio with this particular microphone. They're not very expensive comparatively. You get three microphones for $600. So you have three heads. As I mentioned, you've got a cardioid, an omni, and a supercard all in, in one. So it doesn't matter how bad you are at audio, this will make you look good. That's why I'm a big fan of this, this system. More often than not, it's really fun because you go walking into these church, uh, church environments to record, you know, I would call them C-level touring artists. Um, and the church tells you, I can't, we can't get great sound in here no matter what, because of AC, because of creaky floors, because of this, that, the other thing. And with these microphones, you're, you're always going to get a great sound. But there's, yes, sir. The 4053, 4053. And you can buy it in a kit, or you can buy it just as a, a standalone. I buy the kit, or I use the kits. We can also throw in a wired microphone system. Whoops, got a little tangle here. Also can throw in wired uh, microphone systems. Audio-Technica 831. The 831 is an amazing wired uh, microphone. If, if you've seen films like uh, U571, really bad John Bon Jovi, Bill Paxton movie, most of the audio, um, the sound effects in that were recorded using an Audio-Technica 831 lavalier to capture, for example, great underwater sounds of, of diesel engines. 831, a couple of BBs in the reservoir tip of a non-lubricated condom, put the condom on the microphone, the BBs in the reservoir tip are to pull it down underneath the water, and now all of a sudden you've got a, a microphone you can put underwater, put speakers up against an aquarium, play diesel truck sounds through it, and you've got a great submarine underwater. You need to record torpedoes firing, Daisy Red Rider BB gun in one end of the aquarium, 831 in a reservoir tip condom in the other end of the aquarium, fire it, you have a really beautiful torpedo sound. There's lots of ways that we can use some of these tools for sound design. Uh, another great sound with an 831, probably my favorite tool of all, is take an 831, cut the end of a celery stalk off, insert the 831 to the butt end of the, the celery, and then break it. You've got instant bones breaking in violent action scenes. It sounds amazing when you, you know, take some of these different things. So you'd be surprised at what we can do with these little lab mics in a variety of different circumstances. Another thing that, we carry, that I carry for the microphones, you're going to need, especially in today's world where you're mostly dealing with three eighths inch microphone inputs, such as on the Blackmagic design system here, you, are, you need a way to get a low impedance signal into this box. So we carry these fairly inexpensive converters that plug in 
give this XLR on the back end, and with a 9 volt battery, you all of a sudden have a 48 volt phantom power supply into the, built out of the system right here. So, you know, again, really easy way to interface different kinds of pieces of equipment across the board. How am I doing so far? Making sense to y'all? Okay. Um, other things that we can do with mics, and by the way, uh, whenever I see these go on sale at Old Navy, I go buy these ridiculous insulated lunch bags. You can usually buy them for $1.99 to 4 bucks. They're really inexpensive. They are the coolest things to carry gear in that you'd ever you know, imagine because you can label them, you can do different things with them. But I also carry a couple of other different types of mics that I want to point out to you. Uh, some of them are specialty mics and some of them are really tangled up in here. I think I got in a hurry after my last session. There we go. So this is a, a, an XY microphone rig. Excuse me, that's designed to give us two different, if I can get to the, the mic heads, we've got two different mic heads that are built into here. Where would I use something like this if I'm recording choirs, if I'm recording large audiences, if I have a boardroom and I don't have my typical audio gear uh, set up with me, maybe I, I get into a scenario where I need to record a board, but I don't realize that I've got people spread across the table. These give me an ORTF or an XY configuration that I can record just about anything that you might run across. I mentioned what I would normally use in a boardroom environment. I typically would use a mouse mic or what's called a boundary mic. Some of you are, in your heads are probably saying, oh, that's a PZM mic. It's, this is not a PZM microphone. PZM is a microphone format built by Crown. Um, this works a little bit differently. This is a, a cardioid mic. When we lay this down in front of a, a speaker, we get beautiful rejection off the backside. We've got great pickup to the right, to the left, and to the front. If you go into most of your, your uh, legislative chambers, you will often find this microphone mounted in the legislator's box because they, they reject the sound that's everywhere else. But these work really great for boardroom, uh, church, weddings, uh, productions where you need to hide microphones and you can't really put a microphone on talent. Uh, this is a, a really great tool for that kind of thing. The, drop, the drawback to these is they are phantom powered. So again, you're gonna need to have some kind of device that can deliver phantom power um, or a battery operated system. Sorry? This is the Audio-Technica boundary mic and I, you know what, I've forgotten the, the model number on this. I've, I've just called it the small and the large. Uh, this is the 877 from AT. They have a larger one. Now you'll notice the shape is a little unusual. The reason for the shape is they are set up so if you did, do, did have to do a 360 on a round table, the microphones can all be set next to each other and they lock into, they don't physically lock, but they can sit together and be taped together as one unit. So it's, a, a, again, a really great way that you can work with them. When you combine this with an Audio-Technica auto mixer, and I don't use those, but it's a pretty cool tool. When you combine these with the auto mixer, it has an intelligent circuit, circuit in it. It's not AI. It's just an intelligent circuit that if we start to see feedback from any one microphone, it's smart enough to turn off all the other microphones that are in the display or in the array. So these can be used for a real great variety of different things. They're inexpensive. This one comes in at about $149. Uh, Guitar Center has them, B&H, yada, yada, yada. Uh, wireless mics. I'm gonna get in just briefly into wireless mics. Uh, I think I've covered most of the, the stuff here. So as we start talking about um, working with wireless mics. One of the biggest things that you will have problems with in remote production with wireless mics, most wireless mics are designed for short range. They're designed frequently for indoor types of applications. But the biggest challenge to wireless mics is when people use them the way that I'm using this wireless right now. So I've got the transmitter back here. That's where most people put them, behind their backs. And more often than not, the camera's right there in the back of the room, and that's where the receiver is. So what's in between the transmitter and the receiver. How well does radio go through water? It doesn't. This is why submarines have to come to the cl close to the surface to re receive transmissions. And if they're down under the water, they work with ELF, which is extremely low frequencies. They can transmit one character per minute. So to transmit my name, Douglas, would take you seven long time. So radio and water don't mix. Now when you combine this behind me, and you have the camera operator back there, and maybe he looks like me, he or she, or maybe they're bigger. Same problem. Now this is working really well because the receiver is right there. It's a direct line of sight. But one of the things you want to think about when you're using wireless microphones is instead of doing the lazy, easy thing that's convenient and putting the receiver back there at the back of the room on the camera, consider putting the receiver over here and running a cable so that it's a direct line of transmission. It's just kind of one of the things that you probably often don't think about and you wonder how do you deal with the dropouts. Nine times out of ten when you're dealing with a fairly inexpensive wireless microphone system and you have dropouts, it's usually water. 
that's creating the problem. And so we want to get a direct line of sight there. Remember, the wireless microphone isn't there for your convenience as a producer or a shooter. It's there for the convenience of the person that's walking around the room. Does that make sense? So if we can get the transmitter receiver direct line of sight, that means the receiver goes over here, we run a mic cable to the back of the room, the speaker still has freedom of movement, but we're free of dropout risk. And today, dropout risk is greater than it's ever been because we have so much stuff. You know, you, who in here doesn't at least have a, a tablet and a, and a cell phone that you're carrying around with you or a laptop and a cell that you're carrying around with you? And then we have the SCRs, the systems that control the dimmers that are in a room like this. And then we have the, the projector that might be running on Wi-Fi, but even so, it's got its own uh, EMI that's going on inside of it. We have so LED light bulbs, all of these things that we didn't used to have are creating problems for us. So we need to be armored and prepared to avoid dropouts by having you know, these kinds of things put together and creating whatever pathways we can to make sure things are clean. Another reason why this is important, let's step back to where we started. This is a backpack production system. This is not top of the line equipment. We're not shooting with the very best that money can buy. We're, we're shooting with equipment that at best is somewhat disposable because we're interested in getting the content and getting out. That, that's what we're after. So, if we're already challenged with some of the gear that we choose because we chose to go with lightweight equipment, we need to be prepared for that light equipment to fail. And the best way to prepare for it to fail is to plan for it to fail. Therefore, you create risk mitigation so it doesn't. I've got a couple more things I want to show you, but I wanted to open the floor for questions while we still have a manager. Sir. Yeah. With a, it depends on the tablet that I'm using, but generally what I'm doing is I've got a, a US, an HDMI to USB converter a bi-directional USB, and so it feeds right into the tablet that way. In some cases, now Greenberg, uh, a few months ago anyway, showed me a wire, wireless way of being to, to, to deliver it. I found it really difficult, but I'm also in a variety of environments. He's generally in sort of fixed environments where he's got time. But my point is there are tools where, where you can do that. Uh, there's also a tool called the Live Deck. Um, they just discontinued the original Live Deck. The Live Deck 2 is coming out here at this NAB show. And it's a USB device that plugs into your tablet. You have a software reader. And it's actually capable of capturing time code if your camera can broadcast the code. Sir. The recorder that's right here, this recorder? This one is made by a company called Ederol. Uh, yeah, they've just rebranded. They, um, they are now part of video devices. And I think, it's, I think they changed the model number. This was discontinued uh, probably two years ago, but I still live it and love it. I'm not that guy that has to have the latest, greatest. They are on the floor here. Uh, Jeff Edwards is, is down there from, from uh, Roland, so you can go have a look and see what they've got. Uh, this one is called the R4, is the model number. That's got, because uh, it's got the four channels of, of uh, input and four channels of simultaneous output. So I, I generally, again, I generally run the Audio-Technica System 10. And I guess I, I should explain why I use AT, because it's sort of a silly story. But I grew up in the, in the music industry, in a, basically in a studio. I started working in a studio at the age of 15 years old, sweeping floors, not doing anything sexy, putting away microphone cables, cleaning up beer cans and stuff like that. But one of the things that I learned when I was younger is that when we, when we record, let's say we're going to record a drum kit. Anybody here a musician been in a studio before, a few of you? What do you use on a kick drum usually? Sorry? Okay, a C112. How about a PL20 or anybody using a, like an electro voice or something, a soup can mic? Oh, and that, what's that? Or four, okay, 429. And for toms, what are you using? Same thing, he's using a 421 on a snare. You're a 57 guy or? See, we're mixing, we've, we've just mixed three mic brands and this is just two guys talking. We've mixed three different mic brands. And you know, we had it in our heads that we had to do all of this stuff this way. And then, um, and, I was, and I've used it all. I've got Neumanns, I've got ESPs, I've got DPC, DPI, I've got microphones out the wazoo. Lots of different kinds of microphones. But then, I met a guy from Audio-Technica when we were uh, recording Olymp the Olympics, and every mic spec at the, at the Olympics was an AT. Come on, this is insane. You're miking balance beams, and you're miking basketball courts, and you're miking horses, and you're miking buoys for the sailing competitions, etc. And they're all the same brand. This is insane. Why would you do such a thing? And he <laughs> never forget. He says, son, let me tell you a story. He says, are you into politics? And I lied and said, no, not at all. I really am. But, but the conversation was, well, you know, he says, if, if you're into politics, you like being with people that are like you. Okay, yeah, where's this going? Well, microphones have personalities. And when the personalities are all of a similar cut, it's easier to navigate 
the sound that you need to get. And I never thought about it that way. So I contacted a friend of mine at Audio Technic, his name's Steve Savanu. He just retired from AT uh, last, uh, what, last Christmas. But I said, Steve, I want to try something. I want to mic up a drum kit with just straight AT. And I want to mic uh, a, a guitar rig and vocals with just straight AT. So he sent me this big box of microphones to work with for a month. And I'll be damned. I learned that because I'm dealing with a microphone line that has similar personalities, similar characteristics across the entire line because they're designed by the same group of engineers. Oh my goodness, I didn't find myself tweaking the EQs all over to, to get my 57 to have that nice crack. I didn't find myself tweak, tweaking a 421 on a tom to get this nice, you know, thick rumble. I didn't find myself working with my Pearl 850s to get a good cymbal sound overhead. Everything just kind of came together with some minor tweaks, and it saved my life. As a producer, I learned that by using similar palettes of sonic clarity, I was cutting my time in half, or better. I wasn't worrying about, oh my gosh, the compression on the tom is screwing with the compression on the kick drum. I'm not worried about breathing and pumping between two different microphones. So I learned uh, from this experience that working this way saved me grief. Now, that doesn't mean it's the right thing for you. But for me, it worked really, really well. And I think that, small as they may be, my successes speak for themselves. You know, over, I produced over 300 records for other artists, have 15 of my own uh, recordings. I'm really fast at production, due in part to, you know, nearly 50 years of being behind mixing consoles and working with microphones, but due in great part to the lesson that I learned when I was in my mid-20s about using one style of mic. And it doesn't have to be AT. Uh, I can tell you there are people that just live in the world of nothing but Sennheiser, nothing but Shure, nothing but DPS. There are people that just choose their line, but it speeds their workflow. So that's a, if I can give you one little tidbit of something uh, that works well in my world, that's something you take away. I realize that was a long soliloquy on what microphones that I use. Does that make, does that make sense? Right? It's, it's a whole lot easier. You know, it's kind of like going to Sherwin-Williams and Home Depot to choose your paint. You know, things are similar, but not quite, and you're having to adjust. So it's that kind of piece. I'm going to show you a couple, two other little things that I carry in my kit that I failed to mention. The first thing that I could not live without <laughs> is my, my three color or my neutral card. I could not live without this. This particular one that I have, I really like because remember we have these aperture lights? They slide very nicely inside. So I've got my, my, uh, gradual, my gradient card, my neutral card on one side and I have a diffuser on the other. This is really handy. These are, uh, if you're lucky, they're given away on the show floor. And if, you, if they're not, they're 10 bucks at your local B&H Autorama. They're really inexpensive. So I carry one of these everywhere that I go and I find them really useful, even if I'm just doing cell phone photography. And then the other thing that I carry everywhere, you don't always know that you have lighting. These come in a variety of sizes. They make them in a pocket kit. They're probably giving them away on the floor uh, down there. But this is a five-way reflector. Folds down really small. I've got a, a black, I have a silver, I have a gold, a white, and a diffuse. 15, 20 bucks. They wear out after about five years. The gold starts to flake off. So just be aware of that. But for 20 bucks, what do I care? And they fold up really nicely and throw them away in a kit. I've got about five minutes left that I can answer some, some questions about any of the gear that we're carrying here or, or you know, some of what I'm doing. Sir, so there's a lot of different labs that'll work. I, I've, I've told you which one I really love. Uh, if you need to work, if you uh, can't work with a wireless for whatever reason. There are myriad uh, USB labs that are pretty well made that are out there today. Um, and most of them, if they're software based, they'll, they will self-correct in whatever software you're using. And, yeah, in fact, there's some that have emulators. There's a, an emulator out there that'll take something like a Shure SM58 and turn it into a Neumann. Just, you know, some amazing stuff. But anyway, inexpensive USB labs work really, really well. For my podcast, I use the Audio Technica uh, AT2020 exclusively. I really like the fact that it makes me sound important. It's got a big, thick, I like to say that brown sound. Um, they're very inexpensive, and you can tweak them. You can tune them to uh, have a great low cut. You can boost the bottom end and do a lot of different. So for podcasts and WebExes and things like that, they're great. Now, if you're doing a WebEx with a group of people and you've got a lot of people around, uh, you're probably going to want to use one of the the boundary mics like these. So if you've got a table of, of people sitting around a table, these are the bomb. And in fact, um, uh, in my, um, in my uh, microphones and production session, I'll be showing what these sound like. Sir. In a studio environment, if, it's, if you've got a fairly dead room, a room that's not real live, in other words, not like this room, 
yeah, shotguns work pretty well in those environments. I'm, I'm still not a fan of them because of the way that they work, but if you can get them close to your, your target, um, as, just as kind of a, a stupid side note, I have used shotguns even on snare drums in studio environments. So you, there is no hard, fast rule. There's sort of a, just sort of a generality. And at the end of the day, the other piece of it is, audio is 100% subjective. What I like might not be what you like. It's kind of like food, you know? I'm not a fan of broccoli, but you might love it. What else? Sir? I'd love to answer that clearly, but I didn't hear you clearly. Good question. So how do we charge in the field? There's a lot of ways that we can charge in the field. Um, depending on what you have to carry, there's a, a product out there called Bluetti. You may be familiar with Bluetti, B-L-U-E-T-T-I. They're actually manufactured here in Las Vegas. Bluetti has got uh, power banks that are about this size that'll give you four hours of 110 volts out of a really small package. Um, they have other systems that are, I don't have one, but I'm looking forward to playing with one. They have a system that's solar powered that is capable of, of delivering 2,500 watts in a package not much bigger than this, um, but, and solar charged. So generally the idea is you just leave it out somewhere and let the, uh, attach the solar panel to it, run the low voltage solar panel cable to the device, and then you've got uh, about six hours of, of full power. The other thing that, that I carry, uh, I thought I had on this kit right here, maybe I don't, uh, battery banks. Just get, get yourself a high-end, high milliwatt battery bank, and that'll, that will charge all of these different lighting systems that you have over you, and they work pretty well. I do like the removable battery systems of, say, something like the, the uh, light panels kit that I've got here, because you can pull the batteries out. The problem is, is A, AA batteries are expensive, they're bad for the environment, and you have to carry a lot of them. So I'm a big fan of the rechargeable side of that world where I can, where I can get them. Now, some of the systems out there, by the way, you can plug a... Uh, you can plug a solar panel directly into it and power it you know, from solar energy. One more, and then I have to pack it all. Clear in the back. You're going to have to be real loud. Oh, yes, what about Unity? Well, you could use Zoom. The problem is Zoom doesn't have multi-channels that you can switch between. So think of Unity as being like a 16-channel radio that happens over your cell phone. More like an, it's, it's closer to Nextel than it would be, say, a, a Zoom. You guys remember Nextel? It was really annoying. Two-way, yeah, two Yes, yeah, so, and it also has Vox Talk, so you know, it, uh, audio, uh, speech to, to talk. So, it'll, it, so it's got automatic switching, a variety of different things. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with me here this morning. I hope it was fruitful and beneficial. Thank you.